over the Bahya Sutta, which I mentioned yesterday. So the Bahya Sutta is from the Kodika Nikaya, um, uh, book number three, Sutta number ten. Uh, book number three, I believe, is the Udana Sanyutta, uh, not Sanyutta, the Udana. Um, so the Kodika Nikaya is composed of a bunch of small books that have mostly a lot of small, short verses or short stories. So the Kodika Nikaya includes the Dhammapada, the Udana, the Itivutika, the Sutta Nipata, um, Terigata, Teragata, and then those are the ones of main interest. And then there's a handful of other uh, unusual or, or interesting bits which we don't find elsewhere in the suttas. So the Bahya Sutta is one of those interesting little bits from the Kodika Nikaya. <coughs> Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati at Jaita's Grove in Anattapindika's park. On this occasion, Bahiya Daruchiriya was living at Suparaka on the shore of the ocean. He was honored, respected, revered, worshipped, and esteemed, and he received robes, alms food, dwellings, medicine, and medical supplies. Then when Bahiya was alone in retreat, this thought arose in his mind. There are beings in this world who are arhants, or are on the way to becoming arhats. I am one of them. A deva who used to be one of Bahia's relatives knew what Bahia was thinking, and out of compassion and well-wishing for Bahia, he approached Bahia and said to him, Bahia, you are certainly not an arhant, <laughs> and you are not on the way to becoming an arhant. You aren't even doing the practices by means of which you could be an arhant or be on the way to becoming an arhant. Bahia replies, Then who in this world of devas is currently an arhant or on the way to becoming an arhant? Bahia, in the northern country there is a city named Savati. That is where the Blessed One lives now, the arhant, the fully self-awakened one. Bahia, that Blessed One is an arhant and teaches the way to become an arhat. Motivated by that deva, Bahia left Suparaka. On his way to Savati, he only stayed one night in each place he passed through. Um, in other words, he, he wasn't wasting any time. Um, like, he would only stop in order to rest, and then he would start up again. When he arrived, he went to Jaita's Grove and entered Anattapindika's park. On this occasion, several monks were doing walking meditation in the open air. Bahia approached those monks and said to them, Bhante, where does the Blessed One currently live, the Arhant, the fully self-awakened one? We wish to see the Blessed One, the Arhant, the fully self-awakened one. And the monk replies, Bahia, he has entered a residential area for alms. Then Bahia went through Jeta's grove, leaving it behind and entering Savati. There he saw the Blessed One going for alms in Savati, inspiring, inspirational, his appearance peaceful, his mind peaceful, with the utmost self-mastery and tranquility, trained, restrained, self-controlled, and majestic. Uh, so the word translated here as majestic is Naga. Uh, so Naga uh, literally means uh, either elephant or dragon. Um, but it's used also to refer to any being who is exceptionally majestic, dignified, and lordly. Um, so Naga is often then used to refer to awakened ones. Having seen the Blessed One, he approached him and lowered himself to the ground with his head at the Blessed One's feet, saying, Teach me the Dhamma, Bhante, Blessed One. Teach me the Dhamma, Sublime One, for the sake of my long-term benefit and happiness. When this was said, the Blessed One said to Bahia, This is not the time, Bahia. I have entered a residential area for alms. A second time, Bahia said to the Blessed One, Bhante, it is hard to know how long the Blessed One's life will last, or how long my life will last. Teach me the Dhamma, Bhante, Blessed One. Teach me the Dhamma, Sublime One, for the sake of my long-term benefit and happiness. In other words, who knows when we're going to die? Let's not waste any time. 
A second time, the Blessed One said to Bahia, This is not the time, Bahia. I have entered a residential area for alms. Uh, a third time, Bahia said to the Blessed One, Bhante, it is hard to know how long the Blessed One's life will last or how long my life will last. Teach me the Dhamma, Bhante, Blessed One. Teach me the Dhamma, Sublime One, for the sake of my long-term benefit and happiness. So the next time you ask somebody for something and they're not immediately forthcoming, just say, we don't know how long we're going to live. <laughs> <laughs> this comes up every time I, I ask for ice cream. It's always like, no, 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 Bunte, you don't need ice cream. It's like, who knows how long this life will last? <laughs> So that doesn't work either. <laughs> so the Buddha answers, Therefore, Bahia, this is how you are to train yourself. In the seen, there will be just the seen. In the heard, there will be just the heard. In the sensed, there will be just the sensed. In the cognized, there will be just the cognized. This, Bahya, is how you are to train yourself. Bahya, when it is like this for you, in the scene there is just the scene, in the herd there is just the herd, in the sensed there is just the sensed, in the cognized there is just the cognized, then, Bahya, there will be no you in terms of this. When there is no you in terms of this, then there is no you there. When there is no you there, there is no you here, or beyond, or in between. Just this is the end of suffering. Then while the Blessed One was teaching this brief Dhamma teaching to Bahia, Bahia's mind was liberated from the corruptions by means of non-attachment. After the Blessed One had instructed Bahia with this brief instruction, he left. And not long after the Blessed One left, a young cow encountered Bahia and killed him. <laughs> I wish I hadn't spoiled the punchline yesterday. <laughs> this is, there's, uh, I, I got this mixed up with another sutta. I was, uh, yesterday I was talking about uh, what happens in the Magandhya Sutta. So there's another similar incident um, in the Magandhya Sutta. Anyway, so just looking for a moment at what the Buddha says here. There's more to the sutta, but for now we'll just look at the Buddha's statement. So in the scene, there is just the scene. In the herd, there is just the herd. In the sensed, so sensed includes smell, taste, and touch. In the sensed, there is just the sensed. In the cognized, so it's anything you know with your mind. Uh, anything you're aware of through the mind, so thoughts and emotions or, or any mental activity, mental objects. In the cognized, there is just the cognized. Then there will be no you in terms of this. Uh, so in, in relation to the, the object that is seen, there's no you. There's just seen. There's just seeing. There's just that which is seen. There's no you that is seeing. There's just seeing. So there's no you in terms of the object. There's no person. There's no being. There's no uh, individual. There's no, um, there's no self. There's no soul. There's just seeing occurring. So it's just an impersonal process that's happening. So there will be no you in terms of this. When there is no you in terms of this, then there is no you there. Um, so there's no you in terms of the process that's happening. So there's no you that can be found anywhere here. So there's not a you that's seeing an object. There's not an object being seen by you. You can't be found either here or there. When there is no you there, there is no you here or beyond or in between. In other words, there's no you anywhere. Just this is the end of suffering. So the Buddha is pointing directly to the end of the path. 
He's pointing directly to the final breakthrough, the final breakthrough of recognizing that ultimately everything is completely impersonal. Uh, and Bahia got it right away. Uh, Bahia understood right away. And so it's important to keep in mind that Bahia was not just uh, like just your ordinary um, superficial run-of-the-mill person. He wasn't he wasn't just your your average everyday Petujana. <laughs> <laughs> He was someone who had already been engaging in spiritual practice for much of his life. Uh, admittedly, he wasn't practicing in a way that led towards awakening, but he already had a solid background in spiritual practice of some sort. Um, he was probably doing concentration meditation of some kind. Um, since again, he had somehow formed the misperception that he was enlightened, and commonly that comes from concentration meditation. Sometimes it just happens because people are really delusional. But um, commonly, the, the mistaken belief that one is enlightened comes from uh, having experiences with concentration practice. So, can I ask a question? Uh, no, you may not. Oh. <laughs> you may write it down and put it in the box, though. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, there's a number of these incidents in the suttas where somebody attains enlightenment in what seems to be a very fast and easy way. Like the Buddha says something and somebody gets it and attains some degree of awakening. Um, and, and then people complain about like, well, why was it so easy for them? Why is it so much harder for me? There must be something magical about the Buddha where he could just instantly make people awaken. But that's not true. That's not how it works. The thing is that the people who attained awakening quickly had already built up a massive spiritual foundation over many, many, many lifetimes. So they were already right on the edge. So all the Buddha had to do was just push them a little bit and they would go over the edge. Maybe this isn't the best metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> because now I'm like visualizing like the Buddha pushing people off the cliff. <laughs> which is really not, not exactly the point here. Um, but, uh, so we'll go with the metaphor anyway, though, because it's fun. Uh, so these were people who were already, like, right on the edge of awakening. Uh, they were just missing some crucial piece of the puzzle, something they hadn't been able to figure out by themselves, which is not surprising, because that, that final step is extremely subtle. It's extremely difficult to figure out. Um, for example, if you read uh, Ajahn Mahabhua's description of his own path to awakening, his own path to enlightenment, um, he, he talks about how he got to the last step, like the one last final step before awakening, and he was just totally enamored. Uh, because uh, that, that last step, you hit what seems to be your true self, and it just seems so magnificent. You're just like, this is the most awesome thing ever. I am so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, of course you're going to get obsessed with it. Why would you not? You've just encountered the most beautiful thing you've ever encountered in all of your lifetimes, and you think it's you. So naturally you get obsessed with it. Why would you not? So that final step of recognizing not even this is me. This is just another temporary thing. Not even this is who I really am. That final step is uh, something that's extraordinarily difficult to recognize without being told what to look for. So, uh, a lot of the people who the Buddha encountered were people who had spent many, many, many lifetimes getting closer and closer and closer to the edge. But what they lacked is, one, they lacked that exceptional sharpness of wisdom necessary in order to make that final breakthrough on your own, and they lacked a fully awakened teacher who could show them that final step. So they're just, they're hovering right at the edge for who knows how long. And then the Buddha's like, oh, that's easy. Boop, there you go. <laughs> like, you're just missing this one little bit. There you go. 
The other thing to keep in mind is that um, it also requires an exceptional amount of good karma, uh, of, of karma related to spiritual practice, to be born at the time of a Buddha, in the place of a Buddha, with uh, a mind that's capable of understanding the Dhamma, uh, and that has an inclination towards practice. So the people who were at that time uh, were people who had the karma to be at that time, which meant they were already well primed to receive his teachings. Not all of them. The Buddha encountered a lot of people who just rejected what he said outright, or who weren't remotely interested. Uh, but he also encountered a, a fair number of people like Bahia, who uh, they were ready. They, they were almost there. They had almost figured it out on their own, and they just needed a little bit more. So don't be envious of Bahia, because um, odds are none of us is a Bahia, or we would have figured things out by now. Because um, we have access to the teachings. And clearly, it hasn't quite sunk in yet. Um, so we still have a bit more work to do. Um, that said, if you want to take the Buddha's instructions to Bahia and contemplate them, maybe it'll work for you. It's perfectly fine. Um, so Bahia then, uh, it says, Bahia's mind was liberated from the corruptions by means of non-attachment. So he attained complete enlightenment through non-attachment. So by recognizing that there was no me in anywhere in the sensory process, and recognizing that then there was no me to be found anywhere at all, uh, then Bahia let go of the whole concept of me. He dropped his attachment to self, his attachment to me, his attachment to personal identity, which is technically all you have to do to attain full enlightenment. That's it. Isn't that easy? <laughs> Just drop your attachment to self-identity. That's it. Sound easy? No? Yeah, that's because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, then Bahia got killed by a cow. Uh, then after the Blessed One had gone for alms and sabati, had he eaten his meal and was returning from alms round accompanied by several monks. When he left the city, he saw that Bahia had died. So also just imagining this scenario. So the Buddha's going on alms round, and this guy comes up to him and is like, please teach me! And the Buddha's like, dude, not now. And the guy's like, come on, you don't know when one of us is going to die. Please teach me. <laughs> and then so finally the Buddha breaks down and gives him a teaching, and the guy attains awakening. And then, uh, and then the Buddha continues his alms down and is like, oh, there's that guy, and now he's dead. Wow. <laughs> Turns out he actually had a point. <laughs> <laughs> like, he wasn't just being pushy, he actually had a point. Um, when he saw this, he said to the monks, Monks, take Bahia's corpse, put it on a pallet, take it out and burn it, then build a monument. Monks, one of your fellow spiritual practitioners has died. I'm also thinking of the monks who were, who were with him, who were like, who is this guy? We don't know this guy. He's just like some random guy who you meet on alms round, and now you're telling us to like, do like a fancy funeral service for him and build a monument over his corpse? How weird is that? So the word here, monument, is uh, in Pali is tupa, uh, which in Sanskrit is stupa. Uh, so who, who here knows what a stupa is? Okay, pretty common. You see them all over the place, particularly in Southeast Asia, but you also see them throughout Buddhist countries in one form or another. So stupas were commonly erected as monuments to saints. Uh, like when a, a, a very well-respected spiritual uh, teacher died, then they would put uh, the teacher's remains uh, inside of a stupa. Uh, or, they would, or they would bury them and then build a stupa over the spot where, where the ashes or remains were buried. Um, so it's just this random guy who the Buddha like bumps into an alms round and says a few words to. And now he's telling them to treat him. He's telling them, like, this is one of your fellow monks. You need to take the body and cremate it and build a stupa uh, over it. So I can also imagine the monks being kind of like, okay, that's weird. But, I mean... If the Buddha tells you to burn a body and build a stupa, then you burn a body and build a stupa. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, Bhante, those monks replied to the Blessed One. They took Bahia's corpse, put it on a pallet, took it out, burnt it, and built a monument. Then they approached the Blessed One, paid respects to him, and sat to one side. When they receded to one side, they said to the Blessed One, Bhante, Bahia's corpse has been burned and a monument has been built. What is his destination? What is his next life? Um, so that's, uh, it's not uncommon. There's a handful of suttas where some, somebody dies and then people would go to the Buddha and ask, well, what happened to this person? Where did they wind up? And the Buddha replies, Monks, Bahia was wise. He practiced Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma. He did not concern me on account of the Dhamma. Monks, Bahia has attained final Nibbana. Then the Blessed One, having understood this matter, made this proclamation at that time. Where water, earth, fire, and wind have no hold, where stars do not shine and the sun has no radiance, where the moon does not glow, and darkness cannot be found, when one personally knows this, a sage, a holy person of true wisdom, then from form, formlessness, pleasure, and pain, they are freed. Did you get that? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I was talking about yesterday. So he's saying, uh, where water, earth, fire, and wind have no hold. Uh, so he's, he's talking about, uh, uh, so where there's, there's no distinct physical objects. There's no separate objects to be seen. Um, there's no light to be found, but there's also no darkness. Um, so we can't talk in terms of light or dark. We can't talk in terms of separate objects. So he's talking about emptiness, he's talking about Nibbana, he's talking about formlessness. But then he also says uh, beyond that, uh, so when one personally knows this, then one is freed from form and from formlessness. So one doesn't get stuck uh, also on attachment to formlessness. Um, so this is some, uh, another danger that can sometimes happen, is when we start to develop the perception of formlessness, the perception of emptiness, then we can get stuck on that. We can get stuck on me perceiving emptiness, me perceiving formlessness. And the error here is not recognizing that me is also empty, me is also formless. You cannot have me perceiving emptiness because that's not complete. It's me perceiving partial formlessness. Uh, the perception of universal formlessness or pervasive formlessness also completely includes yourself. By definition, it also includes you. Uh, so as long as there is a me that is attached to perceiving formlessness, then we're not free. We're still trapped. It's still a great first step. So we start by developing the perception of formlessness uh, in terms of external things. Then we work on the perception of formlessness in regards to internal things. Uh, we drop that distinction of internal and external, so perceiving formlessness of all things. And then finally we recognize that also the sense of self is also formless. It's also inseparable from formlessness. So perceiving self also is formless. So we're dropping that attachment to a me perceiving formlessness. And it's also recognizing that um, all these separate, distinct objects, all these particular forms, all these particular things, um, are fully contained within formlessness. So you might think of formlessness as the, uh, the raw clay from which you can make anything, or from which anything is made. Um, so like you, or, or like a, a, so you have a, a big lump of clay. Uh, so then, um, a sculptor could take that lump of clay and make it into an image of a person or an elephant or a dragon or a candle or uh, a cushion or a book or whatever they wanted. They could carve letters on it, they could carve words on it, they could shape it into any shape they wanted. 
So then you could, you could say that that lump of clay has within it the potential to be any shape, the potential to be any form, and thus it contains within it all forms, all shapes. Um, so that's the nature of emptiness. Emptiness automatically contains within it all forms, uh, all phenomena. Um, uh, again, though, uh, as uh, you might say, as potentials, um, not as absolutely real things. This is this is also why the Kachanagota Sutta is so important. Is because it's making it clear that nothing can be said to be. Uh, existent. Nothing can be said to really exist, uh, because that would be saying it was, it was absolute, it was unchanging, it was eternal. Uh, but everything also contains its, its non-existence, its opposite. So emptiness is that, that space which encompasses both. Emptiness is that which encompasses both the existence and non-existence of things. So this allows us to go beyond uh, attachment to either form, attachment to specific objects, which is where most of us are stuck, um, and also beyond attachment to formlessness, which is something that can happen when we start developing the perception of impermanence, the perception of, of emptiness, the perception of formlessness. Then we can sometimes get stuck on that uh, peaceful, non-specific uh, openness, that feeling of of infinite boundless potential, uh, we can get stuck on attachment to that and not want to deal with the world of form, not want to deal with specific objects or specific things, not want to deal with the whole relational uh, situation that we find ourselves in, where we have to deal with other people and other things and we have to eat and we have to use the bathroom and we have to clean the floors and the dishes and uh, we don't want to deal with all these, these particular forms. But as long as we have that aversion to form, as long as we have that dislike or rejection of dealing with uh, ordinary conventional reality, then we're still stuck. So this is attachment to formlessness. It's, we get a taste of formlessness and we're like, well, I just want that. I just want to melt away into formlessness. I just want to dissolve into formlessness. and not have to deal with any of this ordinary, everyday stuff. But that's just another form of aversion. It's just another form of rejecting and disliking and hating. So that's still me hating that. Me disliking that. And that means we're still stuck on some form of self-attachment. Um, so then we're aiming at going completely beyond both form and formlessness. Not hating form, not rejecting formlessness, but embracing both uh, as both being uh, inseparable from each other, as both being uh, perfect manifestations of the way things are. Uh, and with this realization then, uh, we're also freed from uh, both pleasure and pain. Uh, we're freed from the uh, obsession that accompanies pleasant sensations, and we're freed from the um, displeasure that accompanies unpleasant sensations, painful sensations. So, I think that's all I want to say today. Uh, today will be prim uh, primarily about doing as much intensive meditation as we possibly can, right up until midnight. So right now we're standing at the starting block. Um, when I ring the bell, we're going to start. Uh, so this is, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Um, 